Association. Our discussion this evening will be kindly moderated by Theo Gordon, who is postdoctoral fellow at the Courthold and an art historian specialising in modern contemporary art. Theo is currently working with the Courtauld Research Forum on a collaborative project which will culminate in a conference on the topic of art history and climate change. I'd like to speak on behalf of all my fellow classmates on the MA Curating course in thanking all of our speakers for making themselves available and adapting so enthusiastically to this new form of discussion. As many of you know, this event was due to take place in February and we're so lucky to be able to welcome you back. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to Fern Inch and her colleagues at the Courtauld Research Forum for facilitating this event. We're really looking forward to this discussion and hope it's a conversation which will continue long after tonight's event. So I'm now going to hand you over to Theo who will take the reins up from here. Thank you so much. So um, I'm just going to run through the structure of what we're looking at today. Uh, we're going to have uh, each of our uh, panellists is kindly going to give a brief presentation or a position statement of, um, of their response to the prompt of the um, of this meeting and then following that we have four questions um, which we're going to work through together and then finally we'll end with a with questions from the audience so um, if you could make sure that you're all muted throughout until we reach the muted throughout and then please use the chat box to type in any questions that you might have along the way and we will get to them uh, we'll get through as many as we can in the um, in the discussion at the end. So um, I would like to invite Heather Aykroyd and Dan Harvey uh, to uh, give their to open the five minute uh, presentations that will start the event. So uh, hi there. Yeah, I hope hi. Heather is going to turn this uh, videos off though. I don't know. Yeah, it won't let me start my video. It says you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. So I could speak without it. Okay, I can start my video. There we go. Hello, everybody. Oh, it's just, on the warmest day of the year, uh, I'd just like to extend my, uh, my thanks to everybody who's been coordinating and organizing this. It's fantastic that we are here after having been cancelled in March because of the coronavirus. And I also have to say there's a certain pleasure in being able to do a public talk with um, bare feet. So um, I'm just going to say that uh, Dan and myself have, you know, practiced for 30 years. We have been activists for many decades and Culture Declares Emergency is actually, um, the co-initiators come from a broad cultural range from theater, from literature, from museum heritage work. But we were born out of rebellion. We all found ourselves variously locking down bridges last November, sorry, November 2018. But this also follows, you know, years and years and years, decades in some cases, of trying desperately to bring um, global warming, climate change out from the margins into the center of the cultural landscape. We found a voice. Last February, we used Zoom. April, we launched 100 people on that day to make that happen. And with um, 60 people led by a horse from Somerset House who declared there and then on that morning, declaring a climate and ecological emergency, we went across the bridge over this source of water, very symbolic, across to the cultural heritage gems of the UK. Um, we actually went into um, uh, Tate Turbine Hall, we were invited in. I'm just going to see if I can get some images up now. I'm just going to share. So I'm going to share. Frozen. Are you yes. there? I think Heather has maybe cut out. Technical issues. <laughs> There's always one or two. Um, Dan, if you could pick up from where uh, she left off. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the launch of Culture Declares, as Heather said, was put together through Zoom meetings. We it was really pushed by our, our involvement, I think, with Extinction Rebellion and our frustration with things not shifting and not changing. And I think our work has often sort of been been involved around the environment and environmental concerns. And certainly, as time has gone on and you see less action happening, we decided that something needed to happen. So it was a core group of about 10 of us who, who put Cultura Declares together. It's a shame that has Heather gone completely because she had some of... Well, I'm here, I'm back. You... So can you hear me? I'm now, we're now a community of over a thousand, as I was saying. <clears throat> and why, why uh, we also have joined by many other Declare movements, uh, Architects Declare, Music Declares, um, Heritage Declares, Science Declares, um, citizens declare and we have um, we believe that you know culture leads the way in responding to crises and imagining paths to a more just and regenerative future and I just want to say that you know we've all been taken by shock by coronavirus it is I, you know in fact, Lucia and I did a talk in, in March and we were talking about the climate and about the ecological crisis. And actually, we didn't mention coronavirus. And I just want to, I just want to sort of read this very, very, very briefly. It's a little bit of writing um, and then we can move on. But coronavirus, COVID-19, C-19, the contraction of the name is departmental in sound, a sparse lobby leading to a vast empty corridors banquet halls, boulevards, theatres, pubs, art galleries, museums, cathedrals and cafes, all closed, devoid of all but the most essential caretaker as the virus takes its deadly toll. And in our COVID altered reality, who is the caretaker for nature? Half man, half goat, the Greek god of wild nature, woods and fields. Pan demands attention like no other, an uncivilized god in the civilized world. When Pan shouts, panic ensues, he demands all, the word forming element of pan, meaning all, every whole, all inclusive. Pan kickstarts pandemic. All over the world, every part of society and whole economies across the all inclusive globe is being brought to a standstill, a still life existence behind closed doors. This year, 2020, is not how any of us thought. And we have to, I'm just going to press exit. And within this, we have to address the pangolin. Pan, panic, pangolin, pandemic, pandemonium. The pangolin is the most predated mammal animal on the planet Earth. And for all of this to stop, for these pandemics to stop, wildlife trafficking has to stop. So Dan has a piece here. How are we doing on time? This is, uh, I think we also have to start to look as artists uh, the materials we're using in things uh, and question the carbon footprint. The pangolin felt here, it's made out of old pennies, farthings, halfpennies. they've been rolled and crushed in domes. Um, so I think that's something that physically we've been very aware of over the years. A lot of our work gets composted rather than sold and I think this is where we need to start to question the artists that we are showing within the large galleries, within the museums. So I think we've probably had our, our time at the moment. Uh, yeah, thank you very, very much. I'd like to, um, you know, just to say, please also this month, we're offering the offer, a digital platform, Culture Declares Emergency, every Wednesday, 11 o'clock to 12.30, a discursive event and one in the evening. More details on culturedeclares.org. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. That was wonderful. Um, it's so interesting that, Dan, you were mentioning frustration about things not changing. Um, and then all of a sudden we're surrounded by everything changing at once. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'd now like to invite uh, Samia, please, uh, to uh, give her, uh, her, her position statement. Um, hello, everyone. I just want to say thank you to the host um, for allowing this conversation to take place because I feel like it's such an important issue to raise up. And <clears throat> sorry, my throat is going a bit sore. Um, 
and I'm just here on behalf of the Diaspora Dialogues, uh, which is something that was started last year. Um, I met up with um, my team members who are from a South Asian heritage background and we talked with each other and we realized that there wasn't enough space um, for people like us. We were born and raised in the UK, but we have ties back home and our countries. So I'm from Sierra Leone, by the way, which is a West African country. Um, if some of you know the history of Sierra Leone, it was under British colonial rule. And we found that these narratives, these colonial narratives, were left out of the climate conversation because climate justice isn't just about environmental justice, it's about social justice, it's about political justice. And I feel that it's so important for everyone to understand that. And I've done in the past campaigns around air pollution in East London, focusing on environmental racism, because lots of areas in East London are actually located in areas of high pollution. And I did workshops on intersectionality and climate change, talk about how to diversify the climate movement. And I did this for Young Friends of the Earth Europe, which is a network of young climate activists across the Euro European continent. And it's been such a jo joyous experience because I get to hear different stories and different perspectives of different uh, cl climate activist groups across the different several regions. And lastly, I've just recently joined Friends of the Earth Europe um, as a climate justice and energy team member, which I'm very excited about because I'm hoping that Euro Europeans can do more work with not just the US, but also countries in Latin America, Asia, Africa, and specific islands and indigenous uh, populations. And my stance is that I wish for museums to collaborate more with climate justice activists, make the spaces more accessible and not just to um, established artists, I guess I will phrase it like that, but to also people who wish to be creative and join the climate movement through a creative um, way. And again, I'm just happy to be here. I can't wait to learn several things from everyone on the panel. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Samia. Uh, that was so um, interesting to think about the local context in relation to the broader geopolitical debates as well. Uh, so I think that's so important. Okay, now could I invite Suzanne to give her introductory statement, please? Yeah, sure. Hi. Um, I just want to be um, transparent too that I'm currently recovering from COVID, um, if we ever recover. So if I'm a little bit shaky or, um, yeah, just wanted to bring that into the space. Um, so yeah, I think a big thing that I've been thinking about um, in terms of art and culture, I'm just trying to share my screen. Let's see if I can do that. There we go. Is that good? Great. So yeah, a lot of the work that I've been doing for the last um, 13 years has been around the intersection of indigenous rights and extraction. And so um, as you can see from here, this is a piece that I did, which is a megaphone turned around. Sorry to interrupt Suzanne, but um, your screen isn't, uh, we haven't, we're not seeing the screen share. Mm. You try one more time. Thank you. We'd love to see your slides. <laughs> not my messy desktop. Um, how's that? It's still not um, coming through. Okay. So I'll give it one more minute and if not, then I'll oh, yeah. That's continue. working. Wonderful. How's that? Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you so okay. much. Great. So yeah, this was an artwork that just kind of represents a little bit about, you know, beyond activism, a lot of my work is around listening um, and confronting and working with the white supremacy that exists in the environmental movement. And that's very much how I find myself as kind of an artist um, and an activist. But as I mentioned, most of my work has been around um, extractivism and the front lines of ecocide. So this is the Alberta tar sands. And since 2009, 
I've been working to uh, raise awareness and amplify frontline communities who have been resisting the tar sands, not only because it's a site of ecocide and um, slow industrial genocide, but also because, you know, tar sands was one of those projects that's a tipping point, which we knew if it went ahead would mean climate chaos for the planet. Um, and so that's just another picture of this, you know, it's well and truly um, devastation when we talk about climate emergency. I think it's really important to know, you know, we've been in an emergency for 500 years. Colonialism is the longest pandemic. And it's just that white culture and white people are awakening to that in the past 18 months. Um, and so since 2009, a lot of the work we've been doing, um, like I said, is to campaign and to work with communities and use the power and privilege that I have, even as a, a person of color in the UK, but as a settler colonial as well, who um, lived in Canada, to try and bring attention to the ways that um, colonialism works to continue to devastate lands and territories of indigenous communities. And so for me, that's what that climate work um, has looked like. And that's a whole different um, culture of organizing. So a lot of my work also looks at the cultures of organizing. Um, and so in that time, we also, you know, this was back in 2000, uh, just after the Deepwater Horizon spill. Um, and a lot of my work also involves archiving and writing ourselves back into the story because in the last 18 months, people of color have been written out of the story of climate activism in the UK. So this was an action um, to challenge BP and Shell and part of the Liberate Tight Art Not Oil um, Coalition. But you know, many of us have been written out of that movement, her story. Um, so I think there's been a long history of you know, challenging um, art galleries and cultural institutions and in sync with the divestment work. So you know, a lot of the times we would do actions in galleries, at the same time pulling stunts at Royal Bank of Scotland, you know, continuing to put pressure on those colonial forces that are driving ecocide and climate change. Um, and so again, you know, working with allies, working with those who have the privilege to confront BP and Shell and to do that. And maybe that looks like a lot of the actions that have happened before, but these are a lot of the imagery and um, ways of working that have been appropriated by the movement in the last little while. So just bringing that movement history forward. Um, and also a lot of the work that I've done has been working with uh, pop culture. Um, and this was a piece that we did in Vogue. Um, and it was a hat that we presented to Kate Middleton when she was traveling in Alberta. And we had this across Grazia. And it was really fun um, action to work on to sort of move beyond the usual activist spaces. And, you know, I love fashion. So it was really great to work with, you know, bringing that message into a different space. Um, and also worked with artists such as Lucy Sparrow, who's an amazing felt artist. Um, she's been doing all sorts of, you know, she just made a whole sex shop out of felt, like she's just amazing. So she worked with us and she made this felt impacts, excuse the pun, um, and it was these felt animals that we put on the steps of Canada House. And this was very much in response to working with art to share different diversity of strategies so that people of color um, could be involved in that. Um, I know I don't have much time and this is a longer, um, presentation. So I just want to talk a little bit here about, you know, again, this concept of movement history and the erasure of our movements and just evoking and, and referencing Ken Sarawiwa, who's a great inspiration to me, someone who, you know, worked across art and activism with comedy to really, um, you know, bring environmental justice um, to different communities and also taking on corporations such as Shell. Um, this is just a quick look to at a piece by um, British Nigerian artist um, Sakari Douglas Camp, you know, this was with Platform um, and this is a little bit of movement history as well about, you know, working with sculpture, um, evoking the, his, the memory of the Ogoni Nine and this was during the 20th year anniversary of, um, of the execution of Ken Sarawiwa. So yeah, I mean, what I really wanted to bring forward is, you know, there's been a real, yeah, erasure, um, complete, um, changing the strategies that are safe for our communities. And we've had to work as cultural producers to write ourselves back into the story. Um, and so I think it's very important, you know, as someone who's surviving from COVID at the moment and trying to imagine, you know, the white cube's over. <laughs> we can't really make work for the white cube. So it's really um, interesting to be together at this time to imagine how we're gonna survive the future and what does art even look like at this time of crisis. Thanks.
Thanks so much, Suzanne, and uh, thanks also for joining us. I hope that you're not feeling a bit your recovery is going okay. <laughs> um, okay, wonderful. Um, could I invite Lucia, please, to give her um, position statement? Uh, just double checking that you can hear me. Yes. Yes. So, hi. Um, my name is Lucia, and I have to admit that this is my first Zoom webinar since the beginning of the coronavirus, because I've been trying to resist this. <laughs> but I wanted to thank you, obviously, uh, Theo, and of course, Fern and Zaina for the invitation and the um, opportunity to gather us together, and particularly just kind of send out a kind of message of thanks and admiration for the work that the other panelists in this group uh, do, because I find myself, by and large, in the position of learning from the work that you do, rather than uh, anything else. So, uh, so that's kind of a beginning. The other thing I should probably also say is that I find it incredibly weird to speak with 236 people not in a room. I think there's something really important about bodies in space and we um, need bodies in space. It's the backbone of emancipatory movement of civil society. It's the backbone of the way that we can express ourselves. It's the backbone that we can, of the way that we can feel others. And so, uh, and I think that is connected somehow with the work that I do. Uh, so that energy, I think that energy and that care that happens when you're kind of in a room full of people and you're like, you know what, my mic just fell off, but it's okay because we're all here together. It's sort of not there, but I would love for it to be there. <laughs> um, so I work as curator of general ecology at the Serpentine, which is, uh, name that I get proposed uh, myself for myself but it sort of it starts from having written uh, on the kind of kind of tail end of a parental leave having written um, a project for the serpentine that would uh, uh, sort of try to find agency in the curatorial uh, beyond the kind of programming about the environment. That is what uh, cultural institutions uh, have done and do and are doing more of, and that's a good thing. But I was interested in the relationship between those thematics, the thematic of ecology and the strategies with which one would do that, or the organizational structures with which one would be able to kind of simultaneously say something and do something or change something. So General Ecology was originally born as a program uh, uh, that brought together some very charming ideas around, uh, charming and as it turns out, incredibly politically incisive and important, but I didn't know that at the time. So very uh, lovely ideas around interspecies communication, and the anthropocentering the world and so on. And we started to convene a, a series of events that kind of talked about that. But the strategy was a little bit to kind of initiate a kind of research project that was in turn going to gather together a bit of a community of audience members that would then mirror back at the institution an image of itself as involved or invested in the environmental questions. And that then kind of catalyzes an internal transformation. I mean, without, uh, uh, maybe without <laughs> trying to say this without necessarily getting into too much trouble, but it sort of catalyzes uh, a kind of internal transformation in which one, uh, one as an organizational body, wants to also, um, as it were, live up to uh, that set of concerns and that kind of community of audience members that are together with you kind of on this journey. And so that catalyzed a series of internal transformations that go a little bit deeper than uh, the sort of doing something about something. Um, and it wouldn't have been possible were it not for the fact that General Ecology as a project that was, by definition, uh, 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 began as a kind of network. So it was the idea was always to sort of work on uh, on projects, on research projects, on commissions, on productions, and whatever with organisations in the arts, but also and very crucially not in the arts. So in the environmental movements, but also in uh, uh, in law and policy and so on. So that led to a, a moment uh, in uh, the programming kind of 
cycle in which the 50th anniversary was coming up, which is this glorious year of 2020. And uh, we were trying to think about what was going to happen. And what we decided to come up with, and it took quite a long time to develop it, was a pro program called, a project called Back to Earth, which is quite quickly turning into its own kind of micro organization within an organization. As in, it's redefining the way that we work together, we collaborate, we organize ourselves, all kinds of things. But what it does is the sort of broad strokes of what it does is it invites six, at the moment we're working with 65 artists to develop things that are both artworks and um, environmental interventions or prototypes or in some way campaigns, but understanding campaigns in quite a wide uh, way. And that uh, brings me to addressing one thing that Zaina, you said in the introduction, which had to do with is sustainability in the context of the art environment. Uh, ah, doing, doing a really quick now, because I have one minute. Is sustainability in the, in the context of the art environment um, only? its carbon footprint, it is obviously absolutely not. It's the way that that white, white uh, cube that is over, as Suzanne said, needs to be turned completely open, it needs to be turned completely around. And for art institutions to realize that instead of talking about their own resilience and sustainability, they need to start to become a part of a longer life, longer story, which may be an artist research project or a kind of um, uh, a set of commitments. And I would just, uh, uh, give uh, just quickly take the opportunity to say i absolutely agree uh, with samia in saying uh, social climate uh, local pow power is power across all of the the pandemic everything across all of the different uh, fields in which we work and they're all interconnected and so uh, any kind of ecology project uh, needs to be in close collaboration with in fact, it needs to be as complex as it is when you're walking or living in, in place. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so for our final uh, proposition, we have Melanie Vandenbroek. Hello. So can I invite Melanie? Hi. Hi. Right, I'm going to try and share my screen. Uh, I have tried that earlier, but you know, technology is not my forte. Um, first of all, of course, thank you uh, very much uh, for inviting me, and uh, and and it's really thrilling to be part of such a great group of speakers. I hope you can hear me well. I'm imagining yes. you are. Yes, okay, brilliant. Um, I should say I've literally just changed the institution. I left Royal Museums Greenwich six weeks ago to join the VNA. I left in a lockdown, joined in a lockdown, so I left virtually, joined virtually. Um, and as such, I'm really, really not speaking from an institutional point of view. I'm speaking really from my own experience as a curator. And I thought that uh, today I'd be talking more about practical concerns uh, in terms of how, as an individual, I try to work within an institution with my own principles, which are not always um, principles that you can reconcile with the, the kind of pragmatic issues that an institution works with. So um, this image is a very important image for me. Uh, it's Bill Anders's uh, Earthrise. It illustrates the stakes we are presented with, uh, our failures as well as the underlying ethos behind uh, two exhibitions I curated last year. So it's Christmas Eve 1968 for the first time in uh, history human beings see the earth for the first time uh, from and as well rising of the moon's barren horizon and, and really the, the kind of contrast between the earth teeming with life and uh, the kind of barrenness of the moon uh, is extremely striking and the crew of Apollo 8 later recalls a heart jolting as they grasp the fragility, the beauty, the unicity of our world floating in space. The picture made the front page of uh, newspapers around the world and is credited with kickstarting the, envir the environmental movement. And yet, 51 years on, what have we done? It's absolutely staggering how we've spent the past 51 years just damaging our environment uh, quite firstly. For the Moonad Royal Museums Greenwich, uh, in the exhibition, we suggested that our cosmic companion is a mirror to humanity's passions and endeavours. But it seemed to me that in this timeless quest to reach the moon, 
were truly altered. It was nice as a journey north a destination, but it was really the return. And ending with Earth Prize and Bill Anders' famous statement, we came off this way to explore the moon and what we discovered is the Earth. The exhibition concluded with a plea to protect our only home for a uh, future generation. So with pragma while uh, pragmatic concerns played uh, an important part in all the decisions we made in the exhibition, uh, Fries was very much behind the ethos to keep the environmental impact of the exhibition in check. So among the 47 lenders, we only had one international lender as uh, a Smithsonian Air and Space Museum uh, in the form of a five-year loan rather than just six months. Um, some print pieces were printed for the exhibition uh, in order to reduce the carbon footprint of uh, shipment. Much of the set works were uh, recycled or recyclable or reused or reusing uh, previous uh, materials. And likewise for Moonlight, the other exhibition I curated at the Hasselblad Foundation, we really tried to uh, group uh, shipments from a limited number of landers uh, only across Europe, so, so avoid, avoided long trips. And I travelled to uh, Sweden with a very young child uh, by train to install and open the show. So that was my kind of practical way of trying to deal uh, with the crisis at a personal level within institutional work. Um, Beyond harnessing artworks' emotional power to galvanize and interrogate, what can museums do? And they can be in a difficult position, most often because they are straining under financial pressures. They may be accused of being complicit to the climate crisis for their choice of sponsorship. Um, they may be relying on revenue generating carbon heavy uh, blockbuster touring shows. And as publicly funded arms lens government bodies, they might feel uncomfortable raising the alarm on matters not altogether embraced by uh, politicians. It's a bit of an understatement here, I think. And yet museums are increasingly boldly responding to the climate crisis. Culture declares emergency has now been joined by Tate um, and many hope more nationals will follow. Yet these have not been skirting uh, the issue either. The civic disobedience movement, Extension of Rebellion, is showcased in uh, prominent institutions. Tana in Eastbourne invited Green MP Kana and Luckers to create this collection. Museum learning teams uh, across the country are organizing public events for schools, families, young people, inviting the public to interrogate society's role in solving what some uh, see as the greatest issue of our time. And then alternative ways of accessing art and collections are emerging out of that other crisis everybody's been already mentioning, the COVID-19 pandemic. In the age of lockdown, social distancing and isolation, André Malraux's uh, Musée Imaginaire um, uh, is gaining new currency. His idea for Museum of the Mind, uh, a museum without walls in which the only barrier is imagination, has been transposed to a digital form and artists mediated through screens. Galleries are streaming out uh, and VR, VR walkthroughs. Last week, uh, Freeze New York, usually an extravaganza, shifted from Randall Island to online booths. And on Monday, Art UK launched Curations, a digital tool for the public to create virtual exhibitions, which is really exciting because it's both making the nation's collections available for the public to play with, um, but it's also showing us how we can rethink the way we, we uh, put exhibitions together. And while we may crave first-hand contact with collections, for museums to be again physically as well as virtually social spaces of critical engagement and interaction, there's us hope that the new normal will herald uh, an era of less success. Um, nothing replaces the thrill of standing in front of an object, uh, and a dare for physical exhibitions would be culturally, intellectually, and diplomatically impoverishing. And yet, as often, less is more. And the unsustainable circuit of touring blockbusters and fairs needs some uh, trimming down. I'd like to finish with this shot from a, uh, an installation by Monique alcazar Duarte, in which she imagines uh, astronauts preparing to colonize outer space with plants and animals traveling to Mars as uh, DNA or frozen genetic uh, fragments to be cloned on arrival. And most poignant really as a dead bee set in a petri dish, a reminder of how closely our lives are intertwined with uh, the survival of these poly pollinators. As placards by school students in climate strikes across the world put it, there is no planet B. Settling on Twitter's world is not an alternative to halting climate breakdown. And now is the time for everyone, from individual to institution, to be socially responsible, to curb access, to advocate climate justice, to seek to tell the truth, 
to join in respectful dialogue about the climate crisis is personal as well as global for many impact. Thanks. Thank you so much, Melanie. So there's uh, just so much come out already from everyone's individual presentations, the questions of objects and how we might rethink the object and also the space of the museum in these contexts, about the role of the institution in relation to the community and to the local people, particularly the most disadvantaged people in those communities and how they represent and intervene in, um, in the injustices of local and global life. Um, and then and the crucial, crucial question of representation and the writing out of people of colour and of colonial histories from uh, issues of, in the climate crisis. And also the quest in the question of ecology and management as well, and this, the issue that these things will require careful, careful management. Um, so we're now going to move, thank you all so much for your presentations, we're now going to move on to the question uh, session of, uh, section of the evening. And the first question I have um, is, what does it mean for a museum to declare a climate emergency? And what effect may such a declaration actually have upon broader cultural discourse? So maybe I could go to um, Ackroyd and Harvey to kick us off with that, please. Thanks, Theo. Um, you. Yeah, uh, so it's quite interesting because um, in July 2019, Tate Modern uh, held, uh, convened a breakfast meeting. Um, there are 36 people there, many artists, uh, trustees, uh, Francis Morris, and it was that agitation coming from the artists that was necessary, that sort of more rooted, you know, practitioner base to say to the institution, to the museum, there is a necessity for declaration here. And I think, I think it's very interesting the way that um, Tate are approaching this. This is where, this is the museum we've had the most contact with. Um, so obviously the declaration is across all four museums. There has, I think, every aspect of, of, of operational business, um, the way things are done has been analyzed and scrutinized. I mean, on one level, 100% renewable energy has now been used, which, you know, in a place such as Tate Turbine, historically, you know, this, this huge oil generating big tank is, is significant. This is paradigm change. This is not tinkering on the edges. This is paradigm change. There's no, we have no luxury of time. That's gone. That went 10, 20 years ago. Probably 20 years ago we had a bit, we don't. What we're faced with is just, it's like all hands on deck. And actually I think the way that Tate are approaching it as well is to basically convene citizen style assemblies between artists and their staff at every level of people who work within that place, bringing in artists working across different um, practices and medium voices who have often fallen outside the canon and then culture sector workers and then this was all under a power to change program or one of the other COVID cultural casualties but I think this is a very very good way people need to be at the table and it has to be inclusive it has to be diverse and it has to be everybody working with an open heart and as much intelligence and knowledge as they have Thank you. I think, it's, I think it's really sad that the Power to Change program has been put on hold at the moment, but it's very interesting when you get an institution like the Tate starting to say that we need to start to question the sort of artists that we're pushing up there. The whole art world, I think, has operated very much on, I, I suppose, on the sort of making objects to sell for large amounts of money to the super wealthy. And I, that's certainly not the approach that Heather and I have taken to making art. I think it's very important to keep into the equation the, the climate emergency, but also the ecological emergency. And I think it's fantastic when you have people like Francis Morris, who is actually really does understand the situation and taking that forward. So. It's quite interesting that Tate is, uh, they, they made their money talking about uh, colonialism and things from through sugar, but actually it was through the sugar cube, the white cube. So it's quite interesting coming back to the white cube 
and seeing where it can go. Thanks, Dan. Does anyone, anyone on the panel have any further responses to the question or to anything that's been said so far? Feel free to unmute and jump in. Um, can I jump in? Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, Hi, so Thomas. first of all, I just want everyone to deal with the definition of um, a climate emergency. What does that mean when people declare it? Because I think we've seen in the news, I think if you've watched the news, basically um, different governments across uh, Europe have declared climate emergencies. But what does that actually mean? So obviously some politicians have their own agendas, but in the movement, in the spaces I occupy, climate emergency basically means that everyone needs to understand that climate change is urgent. It's not something that's happening in the future, it's happening now. And we need to acknowledge that as people that are located in Western countries, that some people's realities right now are so dire that we, we overtake the space and the dialogue of climate emergency, like floods are increasing in Asia, natural disasters are increasing in different countries, especially in the US and Latin America, like Puerto Rican flood and how the world dealt with that dialogue was quite shocking because climate, climate emergency means that we're all in this together and that is what climate justice is actually about. And I feel like where museums fit into this narrative is actually showing global solidarity with other countries and not just countries that are like sisters and brothers with us, like France, Germany, etc., but also like communicating museums in the global south, as we put it. And by the way, I'm not a fan of the term global south um, because it's actually not accurate because countries listed on the global south aren't are actually more economically developed than other countries in the global south. But that's another conversation that I could bring up later on in the day questions. Absolutely. I feel like museums are an essential tool, especially in the education system, because it's basically where we display and exhibit our histories and our current realities. And I feel that there, there must be a sense of like global duty to address issues happening across the world. And let's not just talk about climate emergency on our own turfs because our actions have consequences on other people's lands. So for example, the rate of consumerism happening in the West, we consume too much materials, too much energy from our other countries. We get our clothes from sweatshops located in countries that kind of deal with the burdens of producing that amount of material and I think we just need to be real and not try and pacify the whole situation to make ourselves feel better and I wish museums can be more honest and transparent I understand that could be hard because museums have to respect the funders objectives and their politics and thanks Samia yeah. thank you does, could, could we have about 30 seconds for one more panelist to respond to uh, anything that's been said so far on this question? Yeah. Is it okay if I go? Yes, do Suzanne, please. Yeah, I think just want to echo how, what you said there so eloquently around um, what do we mean by climate emergency? And as I said, you know, we have been in the longest uh, emergency, which is patriarchy and white supremacy. And many people are coming to this work, which has been going on for 500 years. And so, you know, when we talk about the Tate, um, we're talking about slavery. We're talking about the deaths and oppression. So we're talking about complicity in galleries for the death of our ancestors and our communities and sponsorship by corporations like BP and Shell. So those are actually harboring criminals, you know, giving Shell and BP the social license to operate. So there are really concrete ways in which galleries need to, you know, push for ecocide, have these, um, murderers and uh, people who are responsible for ecocide and climacide um, put into justice. So I think there's some real concrete justice and allyship around doing that work. Um, and you know, many of us community of color who have been doing that work for a long time, right now we're engulfed with COVID. We're so busy grieving and healing. We need our white allies to step up um, with that work. So I think again, also, you know, do we want Tate in the future and who are we saving it for? For those, um, you know, elites who can make it in and who will make it in when we have social distancing. So I think we really want to think about if we're taking those 
galleries into the future um, and just to continue to unpack what we mean by emergency because I think there's other campaigning and work that's also been happening in this space um, which also needs to be brought into the mix of that work. Thank you, Suzanne. I could listen to you all day, but I'm going to move on to the second question because we're out of time, I'm afraid. Um, so I'm going to go for this question to Lucia. Uh, and the question goes, does sustainability refer only to the museum's own physical footprint and use of resources, or does such a declaration also entail a broader educational understanding? Thanks for the question. I'm just going to start again with a little bit that I sort of glided over at the beginning, which is what does what do museum often, or indeed any structure and organization often mean when they say the words sustainability and the word resiliency. And oftentimes, if you scratch just a tiny little bit, you find that coated in the language of planetary, quote, sustainability and the resilience is actually self-preservation in terms of own sustainability and own resilience. And I think one of the works that I didn't mention that we've been doing in general ecology has also been to try and develop methodologies and strategies for not the resilience of the art field as it is, but a kind of self-transformation and transformation and necessary transformation of the art field as it needs to be. We know all the various, we don't universally know, but in terms of, we could probably identify the various ways in which the whole field just needs to have a massive shift in the way that it works. And we're trying with um, some of the projects to think about ways that we can do that strategically. The thing that I wanted to say about, um, uh, for me, uh, anyways, sustainability as, an, as a, a direct subject, or rather like ecology is both a subject and the way of organizing oneself and the way of organizing things. And so, for me, the, the sort of question that I want, always wanted to ask uh, myself with this work was um, how to be quite lucid about one's own agency and where are the boundaries of that agency and how can one then work strategically with that agency to leverage and leverage that agency to be able to send, send the work, not the artwork, but the work that it does somewhere maybe completely else. And so some of the, I just want to make the example, and, and in order to do that, how can we start to think about systems and structure and infrastructure and operate ecologically at that level too, whilst we at the same time operate, as it were, ecologically or with ecology or climate justice or social justice and ecology and so on in mind. And what I mean by, I'm just going to make the example of Carabin because I'm working on this campaign at the moment. So the contribution that Carabin Film Collective, which is a collective um, of uh, primarily Aboriginal filmmakers based in the Northern Territories of Australia, uh, the Back to Earth project is commissioning a new film, a zombie movie actually. Um, and, but, and this is mostly the doing of Carabin, we're just kind of participating as a piece in this, but the micro kind of structural, organizational and economic system, micro system, that has been generated means that by in a, some kind of weird magic trick thing that happens with organizational stu stuff that by com uh, commissioning a film over here it contributes to a long-term project project of establishing a nature reserve uh, in uh, an aboriginal run in nature reserve and community run nature reserve in the northern territory of australia so the servant has nothing to do and i don't i wouldn't even dare dream of claiming anything to do with the establishment of that space absolutely nothing what it does however is 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 uh becomes aware of the key one of the various keys and puts one key in a lock that then somewhere else through a kind of very large uh, uh grouping of individuals and organizations really all over the place that somewhere else something else happens and so that's what I mean by becoming quite aware and quite strategic about what it is that we're doing it and what it, what it is we, I mean, we from the inside, I really believe in infiltration, by the way. I mean, I'm sort of on the inside of an organization, so I wouldn't be in it if I didn't. But the kind of strategic, I think that we, we all uh, as individuals need to become quite aware of the kind of structural uh, 
stuff that we sort of work within and then start to really kind of leverage and tweak it and try and sort of play with those things until you get um yeah sacked <laughs> Thank you, Lucia. I wonder if any of the panellists have any responses, particularly to that quite provocative um, idea about systems and the relation, um, well, the relation I, about I, the relation. Yes, Melanie. I'd, I'd have something to say that's kind of very practical and it's to some extent about disrupting the system and working within the system. So, I mean, we've already established that sustainability is not just about practical concerns, it's about ethos. And in the case of museums, it's about enabling debates, uh, voices to be heard, asking uncomfortable questions, um, you know, risking the sack, as uh, Lucy just said, self-reflecting as much as educating and so on and so forth, but also from a, a very kind of um, solution focused kind of toolkit point of view. There's someone called Henry Maggie, who's a curator, on, uh, a consultant on curating tomorrow and a panel member on uh, the International Commi uh, Commission of International Museums, um, ICOM Sustainability Working Group, so I got the, uh, the acronym wrong. Um, and he's been working on aligning museums missions to the UN Sustainable Development uh, Goals, which uh, has five targets around people, planet, prosperity, peace and partnership. And the idea is uh, to uh, protect and safeguard cultural and natural, natural heritage, support education for sustainable development, supporting research, cultural participation, using 17 very precise goals for 169 very precise action. And the SDG has got one decade, 2020 to 2030, uh, as uh, that they've set out as a kind of decade for action from a local, um action people's action and global's action and when you think about the individual the local and the globals that's where you see that museums are really uniquely placed um, from their engagement uh, with individuals from their engagement with communities uh, and really enabling communities to raise the right question but also on how museums advocate at home and abroad and they uh, really kind of work together as as kind of consortia um, and in that sense, I think museums can be real drivers for change if they are all following these goals. Okay, I think that's a very good place to come into the third question, which I'm going to throw to Suzanne, if that's okay, to respond first. Um, and the question is, is how can museums include artists and activists in their efforts to address the climate crisis? And here's the the rub. Can these institutions often rely on, on private funding become spaces for activism? Yeah, I think just carrying on from what Melanie was talking about as well around infiltration, I'm also a fan of infiltration, maybe slightly naughtier <laughs> kinds, but I think that definitely brings up, you know, the question of collaboration um, and working as accomplices and um, as networks, broad networks. So, you know, how can we in this mission to, you know, for instance, work with the complicity and the social license that uh, corporations that are funding climate side and eco side. So how do we work together in that? So I think there's all sorts of ways that artists and activists can work together both um, outwardly, but also behind the scenes. Um, and that was very much something that, you know, with UK Tar Sands Network, we would shut down a BP shareholder meeting and at the same day, you know, Liberate Tate would be doing an action inside the gallery. So all sorts of ways that we can work together. You know, somebody who works in a gallery can leave the case open for a stolen artifact so it can be returned home. You know, really, really thinking, you know, I think when I hear the word sustainability, it feels like a cognitive dissonance. Given the moment we're in, I think, you know, the kind of way that artists and activists need to be thinking about in time of fascism, global warming, you know, Lucia and I had this conversation about the Serpentine Pavilion in a time of COVID, you know, what will that look like in, in, in the summer for us in London when our communities are dying, they're heat waves. So I think that idea of artists and activists, and I really collapse those spaces, we're all uh, humans in this moment and really feel that kind of spirit uh, of, of Joseph Boyce of sort of breaking down and really having that moment to think about what will physically the spaces of these galleries look like um, and how can we collaborate more and I think in order to collaborate more we also need to acknowledge the 
um, erasure and the active allyship of commissioning, curating um, Indigenous people, Black and Brown artists. Um, we haven't really seen that in this whole fad of climate emergency, a real structural movement of the uh, resources to activists such as myself. So I think there's always in sort of commissioning, curating, um, who is given the uh, mic, ways to curate that and programming as well in front of the scene. So I think there's all sorts of, yeah, ways. And I think the big thing would be to collapse that division of, of art and activism too at this time. Thank you. Can I invite any of the panel for a two minute or less response to that? <laughs> If anyone wants to jump in, agreeing a hundred percent. Oh, that was probably about two seconds. <laughs> uh, I guess I could jump in. Oh, sorry, Heather, did you want to jump in first? You go. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say how um, I have seen examples of solidarity with artist groups and people in in developing countries. Um, for example, I've seen. Um, a project called EcoShip. It happened in 2017 and it basically was a peace boat that carried young climate activists from countries that were affected by rising sea levels and I think that was such a nice clever way and I'm not sure if people are aware that when it comes to collaborating with people from other countries where borders are more strict, <clears throat> sorry, there's like a bigger issue of visa so you can have artists that can collaborate, but the problem is they're not, sometimes their visa gets declined just simply for coming to visit the West to collaborate. So maybe in this COVID pandemic, we can use our online resources and uplift artists from other continents. And that could be formed a, pro a product of the conversations you have with them. And also when you're collaborating with people, make sure that you don't put all the emotional labor on marginalized communities because that could be a stressful experience. They feel like their experiences are either too um, sensationalized or they feel like they're not hard enough. So like be mindful when engaging in dialogue from people from different countries. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Samia. Helen, Heather, did you want to have a quick jump in? Um, yeah, just very, very quick. I think um, a conversation that's happening amongst a number of artists is about bringing the rights of nature into the boardroom. That, you know, it's not just institutional bricks, it's not um, objects uh, on display, you know, there are people, there's air, there's rivers, there's trees. It's extending that, it's extending that boundary or putting that rights of nature into the boardroom and then actually decisions are made differently. The other discussion we're having is around where the ecology of care dedicated towards a museum object or artifact could actually now be switched towards a care of ecology. I think museums should be encouraging artists, you know, we need to be looking at replenishing our soil, our rivers, our waters. Why aren't we taking artworks like 7,000 Oaks, which set a fantastic visionary presence, you know, generational work, I mean, a living work, living amongst generations of people. What about really encouraging artists who want to work in those ways in museums and collections taking the long term conservation of those works under their wing and really supporting that replenishing restorative work? Thanks, Heather. Um, I'm just going to go to Samia for the last question to respond first, but I'll also ask Melanie as well to respond as well. Um, but Samia, could I ask? Uh, finally, the climate crisis is exa exa exacerbating global inequalities. How can organizations and institutions address the differential effects of the climate crisis across the world, particularly in relation to economic prosperity and geographical difference? Thank you. Um, so I just want, when I was talking about this question with other fellow climate justice activists and people working in like social work in different countries what was interesting was that people felt that museums um, censored the truth or they pacify the truth um, so for example when you go to the british museum people said that there was a lack of uncomfortable context around the objects and the artifacts in the museum so maybe just acknowledging like the histories and stories of other people that could bring people 
into the story, if that makes sense, because people will feel that their voices are actually heard and they're actually part of the movement. Um, and I don't want to take up too much time because I really want to hear from other people. But yeah, just that's my main point. Thank you. Uh, Melanie, did you have any response? That's a question? tough question and it's, it's a very uh, wide ranging one. I think, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier, the key, the key role of museums, uh, I think, is about um, enabling, it's about representation, visibility and voice. And if that representation, visibility and voice has been overwhelmingly coming from and geared towards one uh, one type of, of, of questions or um, towards one area of the world, then there's a problem, there's, an, there's a real uh, disconnect. The work of the curator is, is about enabling, that's what curators do. Um, and sometimes it may mean uh, stepping aside, so for instance, I think that it can be important for uh, for white curators to just step aside and let uh, their, their um, kind of museum detox peers to take over sometimes the flame um, and and to really speak uh, from a viewpoint that is uh, that is more diverse and uh, that is helping to enable. I, I used to work with someone who told me. I am tired of seeing in museums people who do not like look like me and to see artworks that do not represent me. And I think this is really one of the key issues. It's about representation. If people can recognize themselves in the galleries, if people can recognize themselves in the museums, if people can recognize themselves in the staff, then they actually feel the power to speak and uh, they feel heard. So I think this is this is one of the, the crucial parts and um, you know, it's it's seen in vast ways as, as a kind of decolonizing movement uh, of of collections and uh, of approaches, but it's it's very much about generosity and about dialogue. Thank you, thank you. I wonder if anyone on the panel would like to just respond. Yes, Suzanne, please. Yeah, I think um, in terms of allyship from museums, I think we could really use with support with this retelling of climate movement her story and history you know we've experienced a grave uh, white supremacy in the last two years of an erasure of our culture of our organizing so i think even you know workshops like this where voices like my own or the serpentine um, podcast you know where we can bring our voices back in and that's not just because of the actions that we took but the cultures of organizing um you know thickening that out a little bit, if we're talking about decolonizing, it's not just diversity, sprinkle and stir onto the panel, but from the get-go, from the design, um, from that um, point, how can we have galleries that you know, bring us more into contact, especially with climate change with indigenous frontline communities, um, and use that power of curation to bring us back into the narrative so we can repopulate the epistemologies, the knowledge systems, um, the deep strategies and knowledge that our communities have, not so, so that we see ourselves, but so we can get to the future. Um, so I think that's definitely something I would call on for um, allyship from those who are programming around uh, climate justice and climate change. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Um, this is a good moment to move on to the final section of the evening, which is going to be questions from the audience. And they've been very patiently typing them into the chat box <laughs> uh, as we've come across, as we've been talking. And we're going to go to the first question. Is, and I'm going to, I'll read them out. Um, uh, so the first question is from Ruby Maddock, uh, and it is, how can we ensure that the climate crisis and its creative movement and cultural spaces are accessible to those with additional needs? Um, so if anyone on the panel would like to, um, to take this one up. Lucia, yes. Well, I just wanted to make the point that the uh pandemic specifically has uh, resulted in a kind of accelerationist and uh, uh, I suppose like turbo capitalist putting all of our eggs into the digital webinar basket and one of the crucial sort of uh, things that are missing from going you know the debate is not as clear-cut as 
we either transport loads of objects and are the kind of old heavy art world or we move everything online into Zoom because Zoom doesn't have an instant transcription function. And those people who, and it's not sort of good enough resolution for lip reading even, and those kind of interpretive structures are available later, but not unless there was someone next to you, Theo, uh, but not available in the moment. And so that cuts out an enormous amount. Of, so I'm, I'm a real believer in the kind of somatic necessity, the necessity for somatic embodied and fleshy work. And that goes some way towards saying that the first thing that I think we need to become very, very, very kind of careful about is to kind of go, it's cool, we can do everything online. You can see the exhibition online. You can hear the thing online because that assumes the primacy of one sense over another. Not to mention the fact that being on the computer the whole day is actually quite alienating and not very beneficial to people who are neurodiverse anyway. And so as we're talking in this particular moment, I kind of just want to raise the enormous problem that is the fact that we're putting all of our eggs in this basket. I think that's can, I, can I respond to this actually? Yes, please. I think one of the hopes I've been having in terms of how museums have to rethink their models and, you know, uh, museums have had to cancel exhibitions all over the place, uh, funding is going to be a massive issue, blockbusters are not going to be organised in the same way. And to me, to some extent, it's almost good news that it's, it's, it's forcing us to pose, to reflect, to slow down, to um, perhaps be a bit more expansive, not in terms of uh, that kind of culture of excess, of growth, of consumerism, of more, 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 of kind of throwing content at people all the time. And in that I'm completely with Lucia, but perhaps trying to organize and going back to the original question about access, trying to think about exhibitions and events and public engagement that allow people to, you know, that could be organized over more months, that can allow more people to come in, that can allow people to come out out of hours, you know, for instance, people who, who might be um, on the autistic spectrum, who might have difficulties to uh, go into a museum or gallery when it's crowded, for instance. So trying to really rethink about quality, about engagement, about reflection, about conversation, about how do we engage with those issues at a really, really deep core level rather than just kind of hopping from one event to the next or hopping from one screen to the next. I mean, personally, I'm totally overwhelmed by the amount of digital content that's being thrown at us at the moment. I'm overwhelmed by the Zoom meetings. Um, I, I feel like I'm, you know, that sense of cognitive dissonance that some of us have described, I found extraordinarily alienating. And I'm hoping that as a result of the COVID crisis, we'll actually get back into that flesh experience that Lucia, Lucia talks about. And yes, really create experiences that can deepen our engagement to issues through lingering, posing, reflecting, and so on and so forth. Okay, I have something to add inspired by Melanie, just super quickly. I think museums in this particular moment have the unique opportunity of engaging their staff or encouraging their staff to volunteer. And I think that it's important that every or art organization or indeed any institution or organization kind of make that uh, an encouraged thing that is actually on you know part of the plan it's like okay during this time we're going to slow down our programming and this is what you're encouraged to do with your paid and not extra time for example thank you i'm going to jump to the second question here which is from beth taylor and the question is how would you say galleries and museums could confront the wildlife conservation issues within climate change? Can this be done in an interactive way between art and viewer? Um, maybe Heather or Dan or Suzanne or Samia would like to take this one. No pressure, Suzanne. No. Um, I think Heather, are you speaking? Yeah, Heather's going, go for it, Heather. Great. I missed I missed the key word before wildlife. How can you just repeat can you just repeat the question again, Theo? Absolutely. How would you say galleries and museums could confront the wildlife conservation issues within climate change? Can this be done in an interactive way between art and viewer? Um, yeah, I mean we had we had a really um, a very very 
experiential and very kind of profound experience of working for three years at the University of Cambridge with uh, the uh, Museum of uh, Zoology and also the newly formed um, Cambridge Conservation Initiative. In The building opened in 2016 and we still continue contact. We talk a lot, you know, we still pass each other stuff and in fact you know there's there's uh, some projects that we're moving in and around on i think it's a case of bringing people in starting the conversations keeping a very open public access and then outreach to it as well you know again looking out what has been done you know talking to the conservationists many of whom do actually know other artists as well you know i i think it's a really really important stream a, a very very i know it's not a stream it's a river it's a huge flow that has to come in uh, nate uh, without nate we have to put nature for me i have to put nature at the center now for me around all conservation crit uh, uh, museum criticalities curatorial ecologies we we cannot we have to put ecology at the center of economy um kate rayworth uh, talks about this really beautifully, um, many other economists have as well. We have no choice now. It is a necessity and actually we have to open that up and I think it would be really, I think it would be a very, very kind of visionary and exciting way and I, I almost think everybody should take that protective force. As Gustav Metzger said, remember nature, we have to go one step more now, we have to actively be protecting nature, every one of us. I think uh, I think it, it is that thing that you know one hears the phrase we're all in this together we're all in this together with nature and that's that's where we need to really be focusing and it's it's very hard to make works around that but I think I mean some of the work that we did with the Cambridge Conservation Initiative and the university there around the IUCN red list and things and trying to raise awareness. There are many, many ways one can do it. It's the problem of how you fabricate works and how you introduce that within uh, a gallery system that one realizes that needs changing. Yeah. Um, oh. No, go ahead, Susan, go ahead. Just quickly, I think um, in terms of if we're looking from a climate justice framework and then when we're talking about conservation, we need to talk about colonialism um, and the separation of nature and community. So I think, you know, space in the gallery to philosophically unpack how our environmental movement has been dominated by a conservation uh, mentality. And, you know, and, and with that comes issues of, you know, armed guards um, removing indigenous communities from their territories, big greens uh, making deals with industry behind their backs. So I think we need more of that history as well and problematization and philosophical unpacking about um, conservation because I think that's been the um, lens that's been dominating, you know, the sort of David Attenborough-esque separation, nature, people, population control um, paradigm. So I think a space to unpack conservation, what that means, um, to bring community and traditional ecological knowledge, um, indigenous rights, indigenous sovereignty back into that um, story is really important. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would wanted to actually bring in another question just on these topics, but just to add it into the mix, really, which is the third question, which is from Maddie, which is what should muse museums do about sponsorship from corporations? Um, and I wonder if uh, anyone could speak to that in relation to everything that we've been talking about so far. Yes, Samia. So from an activist point of view, I understand the process is way harder, like it's when it comes to receiving funding. But I guess activists on the ground like to see museums actually refuse to, um, the funding, the sponsorship from uh, polluting um, companies, corporations. But I understand that that is a hard decision because that means you don't have enough money to sponsor artists who are very talented and who want to raise awareness on issues. And I was just wondering, like, is there examples of um, like where you guys came across that challenge? Yeah. I, 
Lucia? I was just going to say, I think that we have to look at how much money actually comes from these corporations and what they get in return. You know, for instance, BP doesn't give very much, yet what they get out of sponsoring these galleries is the social license to continue ecocide, genocide. So I think we really need to have, you know, that conversation about how much money actually is it. Um, and if we're talking about really dismantling that power and privilege, you know, we're moving into that space where we have to make uh, compromises um, and so I think there has been spaces where we've used that gallery action to expose the complicity of the galleries. Um, but, you know, continuing to think about that space of allyship, you know, when we know, you know, Shell, for instance, just had their annual general meeting the other day and white allies went to their annual general meeting and closed that down in time of COVID and amazing work by Shell Spall and, and the gallery sponsorship work there. So I think we have to think about how much money are they actually giving and what do they get out of it? Um, what are the compromises that we need to take at this moment? And, and again, I think also working with that diversity of strategies, you know, some of us doing it um, subtly and others of us doing it more overtly to use that space that they're using the galleries to hide murder, destruction as a way to, um, yeah, unpack that. Yeah, I think just to that end and agreeing with everybody, um, the, uh, I'm, I'm just testing this out because it's not kind of possible all the time, but sometimes it does happen that you get a pocket of money and that that pocket of money comes with an open door or like a semi ever so slightly semi open door that allows you to like then plant an artist in the organization that has just sort of supported you or something like this and that's what i kind of mean by infiltration it's like if you're looking at the potential obviously you have to average out um the relative uh uh kind of ethical standing of the, those kinds of sponsorships and organizations, but also really believe that you can sort of plant or insert some kind of a change, even if you are sort of entering from the artistic kind of end. I mean, I've always thought of the importance of working as a parasite. So it's like, can you look with these allyships that Suzanne was talking about, sort of between the more overt um, or uh, immediate form of, not immediate is not the right word, but between the more op open and overt form of uh, resistance and the sort of parasite, like where can you plant some parasites? And it might take a, much, a, a longer or a different amount of time to do that. And you might have to keep some of the things uh, away from a kind of public uh, eye, which isn't to say like, oh, we're just going to say that we're doing something, but we're not. No, it's like there's some genuine efforts of trying to find ways that you can actually infiltrate organizations, even through the kind of um, seeming one-sided thing of sponsorship as well. Okay, I'm going to go for the fourth question from Alison Boyer. Uh, a lot of language that's been used tonight has been complicated. How can messages regarding climate change be communicated in a way that most people recognize and respond to and aren't frightened by? Now, we also have only four minutes left and it would be quite nice to hear from everyone one more time, uh, both in response to this question and, um, and to the whole debate as a whole. But maybe I'll start with Melanie on this and then we'll go through. I think this is a really, really crucial question actually. If people do not feel that museums speak their language. Uh, and I mean, museums, cultural practitioners, curators, you know, the, the people who, who, who want to speak to them and want to be in dialogue with them. If people do not feel that museums are speaking their language, they are not going to engage, they are not going to interact, and they are not going to be interested. So this is really a, a key question about access. Language is a door to access, and the word access in museum speak always goes together with inclusion and diversity, and there's a reason for that, is that those three things really come hand in hand. So we want that, if we want the dialogue to be global, to be local, to be personal, to be inclusive, we absolutely need people to be able to um, recognize that language we speak, feel confident to respond to it, don't, not, not feel that this is off-putting, and, and feel that their response is going to be um, sophisticated enough. Because I think this is one of the issues I've seen with members of the public I've been talking to when you know, they hesitate to ask questions. And when I say, 
and, and if they do, they will say something like, oh, well, this might be a, a stupid question. And I always say there's no such thing as a stupid question. There's absolutely no such thing as a stupid question because this is what stops people from feeling like they're empowered to change anything. And this is particularly crucial in 2020 because actually we've seen a formidable movement of young climate activists around the world that are literally turning the tides. And they're turning the tide because they feel empowered, because they've seen people who speak their language, the Greta Thunbergs, but also all the people, you know, we always talk about Greta as the, you know, kind of figurehead, but there's so many of them and they feel they can speak because other people speak their own language. And then they feel they can speak at a much higher level because they're being listened to. So that question about access and language is really, really important. Thanks, Melanie. Does anyone want to jump in from there? Suzanne? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, I really agree with what a lot of Melanie was saying. And I think we need to make sure that we're careful about the difference between decolonization and diversity, especially when we're talking about climate change and who is even curated and who is said to represent black and brown indigenous communities in terms of whose voices are put, put, put forward there. Um, and also, you know, for me, I'm so inspired by Ken Sarawiwa because of the environmental justice work that he did, but also because he works with PARP. He worked with, you know, the equivalent of the EastEnders in Nigeria to get these messages across to a broad, a broad um, audience. And so I think, you know, and that means that we need the means of production, not just add-ons on the education programs. We need to get the means of production into the hands of, of young people as well. And so I think so that we can also not just create content for white audiences, but also for us and by us. Because as I said, we've been fighting this for 500 years. And so there's a real need to shift that means of production into our, our hands. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, any more final comments from uh, anyone that we haven't heard? Not Samia, perhaps? Yeah, hi. You're still muted, Samia. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, um, to be honest, I think some of us that occupy spaces where we can spread these messages, maybe we need to humble ourselves. And in a way that I feel sometimes we could get too caught up in the language. And I understand um, in the regards to the news about climate change, you've got lots of like politicians and reports talk about the 1.5 1 1 degrees Celsius increase in temp global temperatures. Like you've got lots of sciencey jargon in the media. And I think it's okay just to simply say, hey, like the world is going to get warmer and that's going to have consequences on our lifestyles and talk about those lifestyles as well because again we are all human we have our day-to-day -day activities so maybe just breaking it down to those things where i feel that that can make it more accessible like talk about how air pollution for example has that effect on people's health and why they should be concerned about it like there's so many different simple ways that we can approach language and um, like Melanie said, like I want people to t tell me that I'm speaking like too complicated because I do have a degree in geography, environmental science. I have worked in wildlife conservation, so I am very deep rooted in the industry, and I find it nice that people can engage with that. So yeah, just talk to day to day life. We're humans. Thank you so much, Samia, Lucia, and then to Heather and Dan. Uh uh, I, I just wanted to stress the importance of like body work and ritual work. I think we have tended, or rather Western materialist science has tended to think that if we make the map complicated enough, and if we look from top enough, and if we gather enough data, then you will get to a point where like the brain understands the complexity of climate change or something like this. And yet we know that the, uh, that the, most profound interconnect moments in which we uh, connect with the environments are moments of actually ego loss rather than more ego. So it's not about getting further enough away to make a map that's complicated enough that it reflects the entire complexity of everything, but rather how can we do the kind of ritual work, the body work, the care work, all of the kinds of embodied practices that allow us to sense rather than understand the, the sort of various things. And this is not this is a specific i'm talking about a specific kind of like uh climate work not necessarily the sort of direct activist uh, uh work which is 
kind of crucially based on information. But, but I, th I think that that information work also needs to go to, with body work, which is usually why I work so much with performance. Thank you so much. We are a little over, but I do just want to give Heather and Dan the chance to respond before we finish. You go ahead. You're muted. Taking part um, in the Easter Rebellion in 2019, pitching tents at Marble Arch, um, you know, with, with our kind of local group of rebels. And it was so visceral, you know, it, we just kind of were living in a, very, in a very, very different way. And there was a sense of becoming a much bigger body the way that we were with each other and just so moving to see people of all ages from all walks of life just sitting down and locking themselves on and waiting to be arrested and people would come up and sing around them and we would all sing and then there would be the red you know be the the red brigade who'd stand there doing their pietas and it was just beyond language and somehow it just completely profoundly touched the core of our own of our own kind of humanity and why we do this and i agree with what lucia says actually the the principles of the body the flesh the sensuality that we are and the way that we feel the hot air the cold air the rain around us is really really important to carry carry this forward we need to move beyond language to some extent to be sensory beings again thank you I think there was something very wonderful from the April rebellion that came out with a synchronicity and how when you have a lot of like-minded people thinking in a very unselfish way, it just makes a network and things start to happen. Uh, I mean, there's hoping. Okay, thank you so much to Dan and everyone. I would really like to thank everyone so much for giving their time and for giving this extra five minutes of their time as well um, and um, I'm not sure how to end really it's impossible to sum up but I can guess the conversations will continue it's not like they're going to stop and um, uh, also bringing a BSL interpreter onto Zoom is um, something that I've witnessed in uh, some events I've been uh, been involved in on online so I think that this kind of accessibility needs to be built into events from their very inception and that that's a great way to move forward so maybe that's a good place to end thank you so much for coming and um, see you all soon thank you so much Theo and thank you so much to all the panelists as well this discussion exceeded our expectations and we're so happy and as I said hope it continues long into the future <laughs>